Mon cher Thibault, cher Zali de Thibault de l'Institut, the friends of the speaker, the celebration that we are making. Uh, it is such a pleasure to uh, speak on this occasion and to, despite the fact that we've been told to come here to praise Thibault, and I am certainly not here to bury him because I know that his heart was just continuing as if nothing had happened. This is just a random bureaucratic moment. So let me begin a little, just a little bit about uh, reminiscent. I first met Thibault when he was well before he came to the Institute. Indeed, I was asked to appraise him as a, for the possible position at the, as a professorship to which, of course, I was enthusiastic. Endorsing, and I told to ask him because I didn't know anything about it. So fortunately, I was saved by the fact that he was all for the job. And we have had some very happy collaborations, both published, uh, the most, uh, in a way, the most public that we had was 300 years after the French had published their Encyclopédie. They got the bright idea of doing a second edition, uh, somewhat akin to the Britannica. And I was asked, I've been asked to do the relativity section, which I did, but then came a second edition and there I felt it was clear that it would be greatly enhanced if we could collaborate. So we did, and we wrote what was a really great article in probably without, without false modesty as good as Eddington's in the Britannica. So that put us, I guess, on some sort of French map. And then we collaborated um, that is published and collaborated and talked about many, many things over the decades, as I said. We were really on two topics, both of which were, as is natural to both of us, off the beaten track. One of them was about how Maslow's higher spin theories and their possible geometry as embodied by spin three. And it was kind of amusing to see how far you could go down Einstein's alley with this um, you know, weird and really unphysical, but interesting um, field, which people to this very day worry about. So we wrote several papers on that. And then, oh, and then physics and papers, um, which again, as I said, were not in the straight, uh, standard stuff at the time, but they were they were sort of interesting. Uh, this was about anti-symmetric, or rather non-symmetric gravitational theories and their problems. And of course, Schrodinger and Einstein had both proposed such theories in their late days as possible candidates, and we shot them down very well. Again. Since then, Thibault's work has gone. As we can see by the list of his eminent collaborators, people who do not take to fools kindly, and therefore you can judge his standing just by that alone, but he has collaborated with people in high energy physics, uh, uh, mathematical physics, and of course, relativity. And he's had a large, I can say, school of co-workers on technical problems in which they pushed the post-Newtonian limits of relativity higher and higher, which is not as easy as it sounds and involves frightfully difficult calculations, which only a master can do and people 
was of course up to that task is. And so that that um, has been the, the keynote of his way, keynote of his work at least, as well as of course having the duty to name co-running the IHES, which he has done and, and doing their the right publicity for them as necessary and so on. So since I'm supposed to speak about physics, let me stick to relativity while we're up, since that was really the whole point. Let me stick to physics and mention that uh, I, will, I will summarize a little bit the work of ADM that is relevant on the way, Mr. and myself. And in particular, I've come back to that problem. One of the problems posed by that, which is a positivity of energy, energies rather than positive. The first problem, basic one of defining an energy for relativity, is it just about as old as general relativity itself and was first attacked by no less ours than Emmy Neffer and David Hilbert. And the only problem was they were my. I hate to say it here, but they missed the, they precisely those two people missed the point because they were too general. They failed to realize that you can only define energy uh, uh, with respect to a Poincaré, Poincaré symmetry rather than full general covariance. And uh, so uh, we realized, we, I'll keep calling it ADM, we realized that what you had to do was, first of all, it was clear that there should energy should not even be defined for solutions of the theory that are not asymptotically flat, because asymptotically flat means Poincaré invariant. So it's the only chance for defining an energy. Secondly, that is to say, with the Nerther's second very second uh, theorems, uh, and it's to say local covariates are uh, broken down to an Earth's first, which is a global uh, constant uh, parameter invariant, as I said, the Poincare group. And that's not quite the end of the line because then, of course, there are um, the uh, asymptotic killing vectors associated with the Poincaré group. But there's also the deep fact that the total energy of a system is like the total charge in, in Maxwell Yang Mills. That is to say, it is an integral of the basically of the Poisson equation form, and therefore can be formulated as a sphere at, as an integral of the sphere at its spatial infinity. And that's very interesting because the two quite separate ideas mesh completely in that on the one hand, you are looking at only possible candidate solutions as asymptotically flat ones. And so to speak, by miraculous coincidence, those solutions are both able to lead to the lead to a finite Poisson source for the uh, equation, for the basically the energy density, but there really is no energy density in general relativity by the equivalence principle is only a total energy. So that can be defined at infinity. And many, many years later, um, Abbott and I, attack the problem of doing the same for cosmological gravity. Keep this sitter or this sitter with a cosmological constant. <clears throat> that turned out to be quite another bag because, of course, asymptotically, you no longer have the Poincaré group. You have the rotations or hyperbolic rotations of the sitter and anti the sitter, and therefore have to, there are those killing vectors, but there's no such 
there's clearly no the rotations, there's no energy as such. However, you can differentiate five quantities, or rather four quantities, from the generators of the five of the four dimensional rotations, and, uh, and they they constitute the best of the nearest thing you have to the four the energy four vector in uh, normal Einstein. <laughs> and this, this is precisely what we worked out. And we're able to show that it was a reasonably well-defined equivalent, uh, although not exactly, of course, as seen as uh, in uh, the lambda equal zero case, but uh, enough to make, since actually we now know that <laughs> Unfortunately, the mathematics very much prefers both theory and supergravity, which I'll come to in a minute, prefers anti sitter But the Lord, as Einstein calls him, seems to prefer this sitter for which we are eternally ungrateful and unhappy. But we have to live with it, since that's how the world seems to be the world we live in. <laughs> Not choose it. So... Um, um, as everybody knows, in, in, in the city of gravity, all of us are living inside, inside the event horizon, inside the event horizon uh, of the universe, and that event horizon that we live inside of is where energy can be defined. So that's so that is all cleared up. But of course, there's more to energy than its definition, although that was a really heavy lifting part. The other part of energy is whether it, as for all physical systems, is positive. And we physicists are greedy. It should be both positive and have zero energy only for vacuum, that is, flat space in the Lamaquil case solutions. And that turned out to be an amazingly difficult, you would think, problem. I mean, in Yang Mills and in Einstein and Maxwell, it is a trivial fact that the Yang Mills and the Einstein fields have positive energy because they're just integrals of e squared plus b squared. And certainly the sum of squares is not is as positive as you can get. And zero, of course, means no fields. So how do you prove that here? Is it true? Never mind how you prove it. So first of all, is it true? And people tried, but the trouble was that the definition of energy is a highly nonlinear object that it's just impossible. So for a few special symmetric solutions, it was possible to show it. And there were some variational arguments, but for many years, there was nothing else. Then suddenly, this, so this went on, and, uh, the, the attempts went on from, I would say, the late 50s on. And remember, the Nether and, and, and uh, poor uh, Hilbert were back in the, around 1918. So you can see the, the time gap. So in, uh, 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 super gravity was this in uh, 1976. And the beauty of supergravity is, of course, in part that it unifies gravity with a fermionic spin three half shield. For, but for the present purpose, it is an amazing gift from God because it immediately tells you that they get for solutions that vanish in infinity, the energy of supergravity is manifestly positive, just like for Maxwell. It's simply a sum of a uh, product of um, the fermionic charge and its uh, Hermitian conjugate. This is because it feels a myorama. <coughs> so the energy is not only is it positive, not negative, but also when it vanishes, which means when the supercharge vanishes, then space is flat. And uh, 
and there's no fair and 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 there are no spins we have particles. So that's perfect. And then this is all, of course, a quantum theory because it has fermions, it has to be quantum. Whereas classical general relativity has none of the above. But of course, it is a special case. So all you have to do is take the limit of h bar equals zero. And then you set, look at the set of diagrams with no external spinners as was over the video. Then you do that, the energy is still cute. It's still positive and that's it. This proof, although it's good enough for all of us physicists, was then replaced by, or at least, and uh, to add it to it was the real high heavy lifting proof of Shen and Yao by mathematical means, which I must confess I've never followed the interval line speaking of. It was a real big, and it's generally you know quoted as the source, but I still prefer to say that the energy is this perfect manifest square. But anyway, and then there was another proof given by Witten thereafter, which kind of a hybrid and which used our supergravity idea, but without the supergravity. So the fact that, the fact that general relativity obeys the, all the physical requirements, and that is to say, energy exists only when it should, and when it does, it is only, uh, uh, its positivity is sure that it's vanishing means nothing's vacuum. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about is that the definition of energy that we uh, <laughs> made was on the basis of recasting Einstein's original um, geometric formulation, which of course was the greatest feat ever since Newton. <laughs> the big job that ABF did was to just not to destroy, of course, but to provide the alternate modern definition as a field theory, a classical field theory. And this was made possible. You never know where these things come from, but the beauty of mathematics and physics by Jacobi, the great German mathematician of the late 19th century, who discovered or invented whatever it is, the Jacobi uh, action principle. And that is something which was far, uh, far more, more deeper than I believe he knew. But of course, no one else had done it and, and um, it has a real place in life. So Jacobi said, hey, everybody writes the action principle in terms of integral dt, say for uh, point particles or d4x, system, but I can also write it general, in other words, any theory, any action to be written generally covariantly by replacing the time with a covariant time that is a time, a time that is undefined except generally covariant and the price of adding an extra degree of freedom and at the same time adding an extra constraint. And the constraint basically is that the handle, this is where the Hamiltonian comes in. But when you put down the action without the solve with the constraint, it's a zero Hamiltonian theory with one extra degree of freedom. And that is a really super deep fact. And of course, for him, it was artificial because it was dealing with, or with the Newtonian time system. But for general relativity, that was it. That was God's own thing. So the action that we discovered was precisely what Jacobi would have given, that is to say zero Hamiltonian, four extra degrees of freedom, which, which really contained the four constraints, energy, momentum constraints, 
and then everything else you can then exploit all the deep facts of of uh, of uh, classical field theory or the quantum field theory in order to understand general relativity in a non-geometrical way. For example, you can have a, you finally have a perfect definition and existence proof of gravitational wave, which is Einstein always was unsure about, but kept going back and forth. Here, there's no question. You can having a classical field theory means it's all set to be quantized. Of course, the problem with quantum gravity are not the problem. The formal ones of setting up the quantization, they are the problems of the calculation. After the quantization, and that is, of course, the primary aim of so much research and uh, I would say not so much brand unification, rather general activity and the rest of everything. That would be, of course, super great, but it will be illusory in the sense that what will work will be none of the above. Usually when the revelations come, and that's why the revelations, uh, and in physics as well as anywhere else, they are revelations because they come from left field and cannot be reduced from existing conditions. So um, I don't know how long it will take if ever to have a consistent theory. But then again, I remind you that in 1924, Niels Bohr said he didn't know how long it would take to have some kind of final quantum mechanics available. And that only took a year. Well, we've been waiting for a long time, so that isn't it. I should probably, However, not go on with technicalities for you because I've already overdone it so far, but you'll have to, those of you who are not physicists, must forgive me because that was my remit, was to speak to you about physics and not to praise people if you will remember. So, at the risk of being censured for re-praising people anyway, let me just briefly say that he is the very model of a really first-class physicist with whom I have really, and many, many others who had the privilege of collaborating on a wide range of uh, important problem. As you can see, from the other speakers at this symposium, I mean, they range people like Sasha Palyakov and Ed Whitten and Gabriela Venenciano, just to name three, and not to mention people like Anna Guanano, mm -hmm. uh, whom uh, he has maintained a long <coughs> scientific uh, uh, relation with, and not to mention the many, many people who have launched and benefited from his mentorship in their career. He has been a, an ornament to IHES. He has been an ornament to our profession. And I am only too happy to have contributed this appraisal, as well as a little reminiscence about mm -hmm real physics or real relativity, if it has been of any benefit to anyone. Merci beaucoup à tous. Okay.